Northern lights illuminate the night sky in the north of Canada. That is how close the Wapusk National Park on the Hudson Bay is to the Arctic Circle. Only very close to the polar regions, north and south, do these lights appear. Up here in the so-called ice cellar of North America, summer lasts only a few short weeks. The rest of the time, a beautifully romantic but bitter cold winter keeps the landscape in its icy grip. But even here, the fact that global warming is melting the polar ice caps leaves observable tracks. The summers begin earlier, and the time the polar bears in the national park have to build up sufficient fat reserves for the summer is shorter. The bears in the park are under strict environmental protection. For the bears, the change in the climate means that over the longer term, they may no longer be able to travel over the pack ice to take seals and walruses by surprise at the air holes they maintain in the ice. Although the bears are excellent swimmers, they are rarely able to catch prey in the water. Hunger drives them closer and closer to human settlements, and conflicts are unavoidable. As cute and cuddly as polar bears might appear, they are systematic hunters and make no distinction between animal and human in their search for food. By the way, polar bears are not nearly as nomadic as had been previously thought. Many of the animals around the Hudson Bay live almost territorially. The Wapusk National Park is the largest birth cave area for polar bears in the entire Arctic. After about eight months' pregnancy, polar bears give birth to their young during the winter. Breeding takes place during a very short one-week period between March and June. Polar bear cubs are not much larger than a cat or a rabbit at birth. But already after about eight weeks, they can weigh up to 15 kilograms. Even at that size, they are still nursed by their mothers. That can last up to about two and a half years. Shortly after the cubs are weaned, the mother leaves them to fend for themselves. As a rule, only one of them will survive to adulthood. Playful sparring and tussling is part of the animal's training program and serves to practice hunting skills.
The Plitvice Lakes National Park is located in the hilly karst landscape of the Karnik Alps in central Croatia, close to the border of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Measured by its surface area, it is the largest national park in Croatia. It is also the oldest in southeastern Europe. The Plitvice Lakes are world-renowned for their cascading formation and their two characteristic waterfalls. The waters of the White and Black Rivers converge to cascade 110 meters over the largest of the falls, carrying minerals dissolved out of sediments to the pools below. The water flushes them out of the obvious tributaries on the surface, as well as numerous underground waterways. The minerals are responsible for the typical nearly turquoise coloration seen in many mountain lakes as the sunlight reflects off the water. Water flows through the 16 lakes over a distance of more than 7 kilometers and covers a vertical distance of a total of 153 meters in the process. The waters of the lakes along with the Plitvice River then make up the Korana River. The natural so-called travertine barriers are characteristic. Travertine is a porous limestone made up nearly exclusively of calcium carbonate. The barriers are naturally formed by the transport of sediments, but also of plant material which gets hung up in the cracks and pores. In addition, a thick layer of vegetation grows on the barriers. Over long periods of time, the barriers move further into the middle of the lake as their material is broken down, or they simply crumble and get washed away. In that way, two of the smaller lakes could one day join to form one larger one. The nutrition-rich water offers an ideal habitat for numerous types of fish and amphibians, as well as 75 indigenous plants that grow only here. This water wonderland, declared a UNESCO World Natural Heritage Site, is visited by a good one million people per year.
high mountainous terrain, towering as much as 4,500 meters above sea level. That describes northern Ethiopia. The largest national park in this area is called Simeon, in the Alhambra language that simply means north. Many indigenous plants and endangered species of animals find their refuge here. The bleeding heart monkey, or gelada baboon, is the best known animal, but at the same time, a very rare type of primate. The male gelada shows off his brilliant red breast during the rutting season. During the same time, extended red nipples mark the breasts of the females. The gelada baboon grows to a height of between 50 and 75 centimeters, and their tails are as long as their bodies are tall. Adult males weigh in at a healthy 21 kilos, and their mane is somewhat like that of a lion. The bleeding heart monkeys live in meadowlands high up in the mountains at altitudes between about 2,200 and 4,400 meters. Up here, the meadows are often cloaked in clouds, and fresh grass is continually springing up because of the moisture. That is a delicacy for the primates and makes them the only one of their species to graze. During the dry season, they also feed on roots and tubers. The geladas do not have a specific breeding time. The red breast and a swollen vulva are enough of a signal for the males that the female is ready to breed. The breeding impulse comes from the female, however. Interestingly enough, the breeding time is synchronized. All females are in heat at the same time and thus bear their young around the same time as well. they live to be about 20 years old. The bleeding heart monkey is not yet particularly endangered, but Ethiopia's agriculture is increasingly encroaching into the highlands. In past centuries, humans avoided the highlands out of fear of spirits and disease. A particular threat to the geladas is the fact that they have become known to be a delicious source of meat. Only here, in the World Natural Heritage Simeon National Park, are the populations under strict environmental protection.
over 1,500 types of fish, 350 types of stony coral, and 80 types of soft coral spread over a distance of 3,000 kilometers from north to south. That is the Great Barrier Reef, the largest coral reef in the world. But this biodiversity is endangered. According to scientists, enormous areas of the reef have been lost, especially over the past few decades. The populations of nearly all types of fish and ocean mammals are decreasing. Whether climate change and the over-acidification of the oceans are the cause is still hard to say. It could be that large parts of the reef dying off is simply a natural process. After all, according to scientists, this majestic coral paradise has been created over millions of years through the cycle of the corals dying and new ones growing on the remaining calcium skeletons. But when wonderful creatures like the nudibranchs and the clownfish begin to die off bit by bit, or the giant manta rays find less and less plankton to feed on, then contributing factors certainly include pollution, the washout from over-fertilized coastal agricultural land, the extension of harbors along the coast, and dumping wastewater into rivers, streams, and the ocean. The total area of the reef is still about the size of Germany and Austria combined. That caused UNESCO to determine in 2015 that it was not yet endangered. But the Australian government has been admonished to put more effort into protecting it than in the past. In any case, here in the largest underwater paradise on Earth, the symphony of life is played out each and every day through the interaction of the unbelievable diversity of plant and animal life. Europe's tallest mountains, 
the Alps. The range stretching 1,200 kilometers from east to west and between 150 and 250 kilometers from north to south extends from the Ligurian Sea to the Pannonian Basin. The majestic mountains are the result of a dramatic tectonic collision as the African continental plate collided with Eurasia in the far distant past, pushing up the primeval ocean, Thetis. The mountain lakes of today are the remains of the Ice Age and are fed by glaciers as well as countless underground and surface mountain streams. In the beginning, only hunters and gatherers lived in the mountains. But step by step, during the Neolithic period, farming and raising livestock began to become established in the highlands as well. It took several millennia, however, for today's method of alpine meadow management to take hold, whereby the animals are taken up into the mountains to graze for the summer and back down into the valleys for the winter. Thanks to technical innovations, today's mountain farmers have it a bit easier than their ancestors. But their day-to-day -day life is still difficult. Until the 16th century, the small mountain villages were densely populated, especially in the larger valleys. But then people began to migrate to the big cities and rural regions became virtually depopulated. Anyone subjecting themselves to the hard manual labor on the steep slopes of the Central Alps, like making hay for example, does so out of deep personal conviction and not financial ambition. It is rare that this difficult work brings in a good income. But without these dedicated alpine folk, the manicured cultural landscapes so treasured by millions of tourists would not exist. Currently, only about 13.6 million people still live in the Alps. The populations are most dense in Austria, the Bavarian part of Germany, and Slovenia.
A relatively small number of types of animal make the higher regions of the Alps their home. The most well-known are the alpine ibex, the chamois, and first and foremost, the cute little marmot, a relative of the groundhog. For a long time, their most dangerous predators were the bearded vulture and the golden eagle. During the 18th and 19th centuries, however, both of these birds were nearly wiped out. Today, only the eagle rules the alpine skies after having been successfully reintroduced to the wilds of the mountains. Building up the vulture population has been successful only on a limited regional scale, but repopulating the entire alpine region has proven to be very difficult. The marmots manage the losses the eagle attacks quite well. Their high breeding rate keeps the population stable. A female bears between two and five young during every breeding cycle. Thanks to their winter hibernation, which can last as long as nine months of the year, the animals are only on the king of the air's menu for a very short summer season. Guilin, on the Li River in China, is the epitome of an exotic dream landscape. The basis of these formations is soft limestone which gives way to the forces of nature relatively easily. Even so, it took thousands of years for water, carbon dioxide, wind, and weather to carve out these amazing formations. Tower karst is the main ground material found in the region surrounding Guilin. It is the result of continual erosion and is found at the foot of the mountain rock formations, primarily along rivers flowing with abundant water. Numerous caves lie hidden in the interior of the mountains. Dissolved calcium in the continuously dripping water solidifies to form stalactites and stalagmites. The Reed Flute Cave in the Mountain of Lights is Guilin's largest cave. One of its chambers is called the Crystal Palace of the Dragon King. It is large enough to hold 1,000 people. A 500-meter pathway takes the visitor deep into the interior of the mountain. A magical sight awaits them at the end of the pathway. The reflection in the underground lake looks like a miniature version of the area surrounding Guilin. The 
Li River, or Li Zheng, provides the livelihood for many of the people living along its banks. These fishermen don't need nets for their work. Cormorants catch the fish for them. Their wings are clipped so they can't fly away, and a thin string around their throats keeps them from escaping or swallowing the fish they catch. The fishermen take the birds out on the river every evening and let them hunt. As much as they would like to keep some of the fish for themselves, the closely bound string around their throats keeps them from being able to swallow their prey. The traditional knowledge about cormorant fishing and raising and training the birds was kept secret for a long time and only passed on from father to son. It takes a good eight months of training before a cormorant can perform its task dependably. What seems rather shocking to the tourist at first secures the survival of the old river fisherman and his family. From an economic standpoint, cormorant fishing is certainly insignificant. The limited catch does no damage to the fish population at all. Every year, in the time between May and June, an enormous swarm of millions of sardines migrates from the eastern side of the Cape of Good Hope in the direction of Mozambique. This migration is an invitation for numerous underwater predators as well as hunters in the air, such as the Cape Booby. The most fascinating spectacles to the human eye, however, are the coordinated hunting expeditions of the dolphins. In synchronized teamwork, they drive the sardines into large, tightly packed swarms and then plunge right into the midst of it to fill their bellies. The rough waves at the Cape present little hindrance to the porpoise's attack. Like a Formula One race, they jump through the spray in the high waves, reaching speeds of up to 50 kilometers per hour. These unique shots were an enormous challenge for the camera crew. It took special lenses to compensate for the boat dancing over the rough meter high waves. Between the dolphins, the sharks, and the seabirds, the sardines don't stand a chance. As 
a rule, the dolphins plunge into the compacted swarm of sardines from below. That drives the fish up toward the ocean surface. And there, the boobies and the seagulls are just waiting for their arrival.